you all for joining us today. i just give another couple of seconds for people to chime in or to come into the room. <clears throat> Oops. <clears throat> Okay, well, in the interest of time, I think we'll start today's session. And I just wanted to give everyone who's joining us today a really warm welcome. We're so excited to have you um, join in our special session um, today, which is hosted uh, by the Long-Term Ecological Research Network and the uh, Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. And what we're going to be up to today is helping uh, students understand what careers are like in federal agencies. Um, I know from my own experience coming through academia that um, I very much um, understood from the experience that I had as a graduate student what it might be like to become um, a, a professor or to stay in academia, but it was very hard to understand what it might be like to work in an agency, particularly a federal agency, and I know some of you probably have um, that opportunity to work with federal scientists and um, that's very exciting and, and neat to be able to do that so you have that intersection that can happen um, naturally as you go through your um, early careers. But we thought it would be great if you could have a chance to hear from federal agency scientists from a number of different agencies and um, pathways in their careers and uh, get that little bit better sense of what it might be like uh, to seek out a federal job and to hold a federal job in your career. Um, so I should have first introduced myself. My name is Evelyn Geyser, and I'm a professor at Florida International University, and I'm affiliated with an LTER program, the Florida Coastal Everglades site, as well as a Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit hub, which is the South Florida Caribbean Network, or hub. And um, I am here today with my co-organizer, or I should say the brains behind all of this, is Paige Kleindell. She's a graduate student in our program. I'll go around and have everyone um, introduce themselves, but I just wanted to point out the hard work that Paige has done to put this together, as well as uh, Marty Downs and Gabe De La Rosa who are at the LTR network office and have helped um, coordinate the event for today. Um, so without uh, further ado, I um, would like to turn it over to Marty and Gabe um, to give you a little heads up on how we're going to run this meeting today. We have over 300 people participating, which is why you're seeing just the faces of the organizers and panelists today, um, because there are so many participants. So uh, Marty and Gabe. Sure, thanks, Evelyn. Um, I just want to echo Evelyn's thanks to all of uh, our panelists and to uh, Paige and Evelyn and Tom Fish from the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit for help in organizing this event. Um, we do have quite a number of people on the call. We had hoped to do breakout sessions and, and that just did not seem like it would work. So we will be entirely in Q&A. The participants are all muted. Uh, when you, when a question occurs to you, whether that's during panelist introductions or as panelists are uh, talking through a day in the life of, or really at any point in the presentations, there's a, a Q and A uh, menu entry, and if you're not a Zoom native, you'll find that a along through along with the other menu entries it has a little uh, two conversation bubble symbol if you open up that window you can add a question at any point uh, during the conversation and then you can also upvote questions so we encourage you if there's a question that's sort of similar to one that you were wanting to ask upvote it and it will rise to the top of the list so we can um, direct that to the appropriate panelists um 
The LTR network has a code of conduct. I put that in the chat. I'll just put it in there again now. Uh, essentially, that code of conduct is just uh, treat everyone respectfully, regardless of uh, whether you disagree with them or not. Uh, and you can report any violations of that code of conduct uh, to me, to hosts and panelists in the chat, or uh, to any member of the LTR Network Executive Board. Um, I think that really covers logistics on our ends. Uh, uh, any, if you run into any uh, kind of technical issues, you can chat directly to me or Gabe in the chat. Um, and I will hand it back to uh, to Evelyn and Paige. Thanks. Thank you, Marty. Before you pop up, um, can you tell everybody what you do at the network office? Oh, so sorry. Uh, Marty Downs. I'm the director of the network office for the Long-Term Ecological Research Network, uh, which means uh, I'm basically the nerve center for the network. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Gabe, do you want to say hello from the network as well? Yeah, I'm Gabe De La Rosa. I work right alongside Marty at the LTR network office. I'm the digital communications coordinator. So basically anything that you see from the LTR network, I probably had a hand in. And um, so okay. advertising this and stuff. Thanks. Thank you for all you do. Um, Paige, do you want to say hello? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Paige Kleindl. Um, I am the assistant to the host director of the South Florida Caribbean CESU, uh, Evelyn Geyser. And I'm also a part of the FCELTER, and I'm a graduate student um, in Evelyn Geyser's lab at Florida International University, helping her out with all things related to CESU. Thank you, Paige. Um, I see Tom Fish has joined us. Um, Dr. Fish is the director of the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit Network. And Tom, can you uh, say hello? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Um, hey, everybody. Um, pleased to be here. I, I was a little late getting over from uh, our CSU director's monthly call. So um, greetings from that group as well. I think there are a number of them probably participating too. Um, happy to hear the great interest and turnout today, and I'm looking forward to the session. Thanks, Evelyn. Thank you. Um, let's see. Now I want to, uh, I'll just go down our list of panelists today um, and have you each um, unmute and, and say hello, and I'll follow the list there. Um, on the on the left of the screen. Um, Amy Renshaw sent her regrets that she wasn't able to make it today, but we're so glad to have uh, Tom Fish here who will step in um, her place as a panelist. And uh, next up is uh, Laurel Larson from the USGS. Hi everyone. So I'm Laurel Larson. I am currently serving in a USGS funded position right now that's housed within a state agency. Um, so this is the position of Delta lead scientist, where the Delta refers to the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, really the heart of California. Um, and the state agency that I'm housed within is the Delta Stewardship Council. So it's a fairly unique position. I'm kind of a temporary U USGS employee. And after this four-year term, I'll return back to UC Berkeley, where I serve as an associate professor in geography and civil and environmental engineering. So this is a CESU um, affiliated center. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that before I started at UC Berkeley, I was a research hydrologist and then a research ecologist with the USGS in Reston, Virginia. So I'm happy to speak about any of those experiences. Thank you so much, Laurel. Um, I see Sherry Johnson up on the right corner of my screen. Hi, I'm a research ecologist with Pacific Northwest Research Station, US Forest Service. I'm an aquatic ecologist and have had multiple roles across LTRs. I was a graduate student working post-hurricane research at Lukio and then became a postdoc at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest and LTR. And I've served as a co-signatory on the Andrews LTR grant for about 20 years. Um, one thing we were asked to mention is uh, my one lesson is that the time periods for applications for federal jobs are really, really short. And it's not necessarily because a candidate has been identified. So if you wanted, want to get a federal job, 
you need to be checking USA jobs or the job boards really frequently and be ready to pounce. And then I see other questions in the chat that we'll be coming back to. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, Laura Brand. Hi, yeah, nice to see everybody. Um, so my name's Laura Brandt. I'm a regional scientist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I've worked for the service for 24 years. I started there at the Arthur R. Marshall Loxhatchee National Wildlife Refuge as the senior wildlife biologist. And my position has evolved to a um, untraditional position within the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and I uh, work on linking science and management. I'm based in South Florida, but my position is administratively out of Atlanta. So there's a lot of, of nuances and flexibility um, in, in what I do and, and how I got where I am. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And one lesson um, I'd like everybody to kind of leave here with is that there's multiple pathways to get to where you want to go. And so don't feel like you have to go the same way that you've heard other people going. Pick, pick your own path and, and do it. Terrific. Great advice. Um, Grizel Gonzalez. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Grizel Gonzalez. I'm a soil scientist and director at the International Institute of Tropical Forestry in San Juan, Puerto Rico, with the USDA Forest Service. And I have been mostly involved with the Luquillo LTR, but I also have experience working in the Daiwat LTR and the Bonanza Creek LTR. Um, I have been with the Forest Service for 23 years. I started as a doctoral scientist in, in 2000. And I think one lesson I would like people to take from this career forum is to know that a scientific career within the federal government can be very rewarding. Thanks. Great, thank you, Grizel. Uh, Diane McKnight has a couple of different angles that she's serving in this uh, meeting today. And so thank you for joining us, Diane. Hello, uh, I'm uh, Diane McKnight. I'm a professor in environmental engineering at the University of Colorado. And I'm a limnologist, environmental engineer. I worked with US Geological Survey as a research hydrologist from 1979 to 1996 and became an academic. And then I returned to federal service with the National Science Foundation from 2015 to 2018. And uh, I have, um, it was a great experience, both of those and very rewarding. I'd be glad to talk about both. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Tasso Kakobes from the U.S. or Army Corps of Engineers. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Tasso Kakobes, and I'm a biologist for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the Planning and Policy Division at the Jacksonville District in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, the focus of my work is restoration of the Florida Everglades and informing the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP. Uh, more specifically, I'm a member of an ecologically oriented interagency team called Recover. Uh, which stands for Restoration, Coordination, and Verification. Recover's role is to inform and track the prog progress of Everglades restoration using ecological uh, indicators. Uh, one lesson that I'd like people to take away from my input here today is that this uh, South Florida Caribbean CSU uh, provides a mechanism by which ecological information is generated and then delivered to decision makers involved in Everglades restoration. So if you're a student funded through a cooperative agreement, I would encourage you to discuss the overarching goals and objectives of that agreement so you understand where your work fits into the big picture. And thank you. Great message, Tasso. thank you. Um, Jed Redwine is here. Seminole Tribe of Florida. Hello, everybody. My name is Jed Redwine. I'm an ecologist with the Seminole Tribe of Florida, and I work in the Environmental Resource Management Department. Um, I have worked with, as a consultant for the Corps of Engineers, I worked with the South Florida Water Management District, and I um, was, spent 10 years working in the National Park Service before I started working with the Seminole Tribe. Um, I don't know that I have a lot of advice to share, but I would just say um, you know, it's important to it's important to see the path of others. It's also important to, you know, create your own path. Um, if if you're, there's something really strong internally that's driving you towards a certain question or a certain working environment or a certain outcome, 
I would suggest that you listen to that to that uh, that voice of of inspiration that you have. And uh, I think one of the great parts about science is that every generation remakes what science is, and so you have an opportunity to really do that. Um, when you take your career seriously and, and engage in it in a purposeful manner. Over. Thank you, Jed. Donato Sarad is here from Everglades National Park, National Park Service. Good afternoon, everyone. Donato Sarat, Everglades National Park. I've been with the Everglades National Park for about almost two decades now. I'm about two years shy of that. Um, I've spent all of that time immersed in water quality trying to understand how it drives habitats and how we protect ecosystem habitats throughout the Everglades. My prime focus is protecting the Everglades National Park and the Arthur R. Marshall Locks Hodgey National Wildlife Refuge. And that is because it's ensconced in one of the longest running lawsuits in the United States of America um, over water quality litigation. I'm going to provide a lot of information over my little four minute spiel on my career and how I got here, so I won't take you too much more in depth on that. Um, but my, my quick uh, take one lesson to take home is just be open uh, to every experience. Don't close the door on yourself at any moment because you never know where each one of those experiences is going to take you. And when you hear my story, you'll see, you'll see how that goes. Thank you. Thank you, Donato. Um, Adrian Sutton from NOAA. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Adrian Sutton. I'm a research oceanographer at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I work at a lab in Seattle, Washington, the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. And um, I'm really an, an observational oceanographer. So I run a program of um, observations of to, to track the ocean CO2 sink and um, ocean acidification. And my research is all related to that. And um, uh, yeah, I think I was asked to be here today because my research and, and our, our time series observations are literally adjacent to many LTER coastal sites in the California current and the Northern Gulf of Alaska and Georgia and North North, Northeast Atlantic Shelf. So um, a lot of a lot of really great um, coastal, um, you know, estuary to coast to ocean connections. And um, the one lesson I would love folks to leave here today in mind is to build a diverse group of mentors around you. Mentors, plural, not just one, um, but many and um, people who will not only challenge you and push you and, and help you to grow, but also celebrate your accomplishments, provide access to resources and opportunities and, and use their power to amplify your, your voice. So um, really, really important to, to, to have a broad group of mentors. Terrific. Thank you, Adrian. And last but not least, we have Scott Haggerthy from the US EPA with us today. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, I'm Scott Haggerthy. And like Evelyn said, I am the I'm now presently serving as the interim national program director for the Sustainable and Healthy Communities Research Program in the Office of Research Development in the US EPA. I'm based in Washington, DC. Um, this role is an executive role. Um, I am responsible for the strategic oversight and the strategic planning of a broad portfolio of work as it relates to the cleanup of contaminated sites and the development of community engagement. <clears throat> um, I once, so I am now in a management role and I now wear a tie. Um, so, so that's the, the my life is at the moment. Um, I've had a pretty diverse career. I started my PhD at the LTER, North Temperate Lakes LTER site, doing my work on Sparkling Lake. Um, from there, I, I moved to Europe and worked on intertidal mudflats. Uh, I'm an aquatic ecology uh, by training, but, a, but an algae guy as well. Um, and I met Evelyn and all the great LTR folks working at the South, when I worked at the South Florida Water Management for nearly 10 years um, when I was a practicing scientist. Um, I made the move to EPA um, to really get, if, if you work in South Florida, you get an introduction to the interface between science and science and society. 
It's a complicated, fascinating world. It's where politics and people and science come together. It's a mess and you either love working in it or you hate working in it. And I'm one of those people who love working in it. And so I came to EPA where I came in as a scientist and then moved up through a management chain where the group that we were looking at were performing some of the largest um, environmental assessments to inform policy. You may know some of these as the Waters of the U.S. Connectivity Rule that came out of our shop, the Bristol Bay, um, protection of Bristol Bay from the, the um, copper mine that was proposed to go in there came out of our inf in place. And we also do a lot of human health and risk assessment. And I also served on a one-year fellowship on the Hill, um, working with Senator Tester from Montana. Um, that was a, a legislative um, position, which was an eye-opening experience when you go there from the executive branch. Um, so a uh, little bit of a diverse career. And my one, my one lesson would be, um, you may have a passion for the environment, but how you do that will change over time or could change over time. And your experiences and what, you, what you're exposed to, um, be open to those shifts. Um, I never imagined when I started roaming through the Everglades that I would end up in Washington, D.C. Um, as an executive wearing a tie. We're lucky you did. Thank you so much. But we miss you as a scientist down here as well. <laughs> Not to be taken the wrong way. Um, thank you so much. Um, so now I guess we're even a little ahead of time, which is super great because we have um, so many great questions coming in through the uh, Q&A and I would encourage everyone to continue doing that. We will dip into those um, absolutely during the Q&A session. Um, and don't forget, if um, you have a question, look through the ones that have already been put up there. And if there's somebody that's already asked yours, give it a thumbs up because we're going to be able to then pull out the ones that have the uh, the highest interest um, first, and uh, uh, you know, and, and do hope to get through all of them. Um, Next, uh, we're going to introduce the different themes that our panelists will be um, speaking on for a few minutes. They'll give you a little bit more of a sense of their backgrounds and who they are and what they do. Um, and then we'll launch into the more open Q&A. And to introduce those themes, uh, we'll bring up Paige Kleindel again. Hello, everyone. So um, today we have 11 panelists and they each been assigned to a certain category that they're going to talk about. Um, and the first being the day in the life. So looking at kind of like what uh, is a typical day in their job like, what are the working conditions, um, how much paper versus people work that they do, and other um, aspects of the day in their life. And then the second is looking into career preparation. So how did you get your job and what experiences led to this position? And some other things they might talk about is, what is the job market like for this career? Um, and do you have to still keep training um, for different positions and topics within your career? And then last, the last uh, theme is challenges and benefits of your job. Um, what do you like best about it? What is the most stressful? Um, what are the most rewarding aspects of it? And how do you balance your time potentially between your career as well as um, your other outside of career activities. So I'll pass it back to Evelyn to start going through the uh, three different themes. Oh, terrific. Um, thanks, Paige. Uh, so we're going to start with the day in the life. What is um, every day like as you go into to, um, to your job? And uh, since Amy isn't here, I think I'll, I'll start back with Tom Fish, if that's all right. Tom, are you still on? Um, to talk about a day in the light. Uh, maybe we'll come back to Tom. I'm here. Um, I just oh, was great. trying to get my mouse to cooperate with me. Oh, good. Um, and, um, and I just, I, I didn't realize when I introduced myself, I didn't cover the other points that everybody else was covering. So I'll mention that for just for interest. Sure. Um, my first position was with with the state of Florida with the Rookery Bay National Estuary Research Reserve, but my position was funded by NOAA. Then I went back to graduate school and worked after, during and after that with the US Forest Service in the Great Lakes. And then 
moved back to NOAA in the Southeast for seven years with the um, uh, Coastal Services Center was called out of Charleston, South Carolina, um, working nationwide in doing training and technical assistance for protected area managers. And then I've been with the Department of the Interior since 2007. So um, my position here is uh, officially the national coordinator for the CSU network, but also um, from a job series, I'm a supervisory biologist. So um, might be of interest. And then I like to Laura's comment too about non-traditional pathways to get to where you are, because I've been worked for non nonprofits and private consulting and academia, and also now in federal service for more than 20 years. Um, and I guess my comment to, for the group is, you know, consider the broad array of positions. You might've been trained in a particular program, but your interests may vary over time. I think a couple of individuals have mentioned that and take advantage of opportunities to work with a broad array of people if you can, because there's always something to learn from your colleagues and from taking a look at other disciplines that are maybe beyond the scope of what your academic training or experience to date has uh, provided for you. Um, day in the life for me, I may be, uh, I, I suppose everybody's atypical in some sense. Um, I'm based, uh, my office, the National Program Office is based at the National Park Service headquarters at the Department of the Interior. Um, but my job is beyond just the National Park Service. So um, I work across a group of federal agencies. We have 19 federal agencies and we have 500 partner organizations. So on any given day, I'm usually mining through my emails to connect uh, and provide answers to questions that have come up related to the CSU program. Um, and those might be on policy and practice. They could be on particular content information areas. Uh, they might be related to, I'm on a number of different working groups that cut across from uh, climate adaptation to One Health, to uh, the White House Subcommittee on Social Behavioral Sciences. Uh, my background is interesting because it's, I started as a biologist, transitioned through science education and into, uh, and conservation biology into the social sciences. So now I've been kind of, I guess, a boundary spanner for a number of years related to both the natural social sciences. So that keeps it pretty interesting. Um, I guess the, the upside of a day, day in the life is that I do have the opportunity to work across a broad number of, of our partner community, which is really always interesting and, and uh, invigorating. Um, working conditions, just going from the potential list that we have, you know, most of my office, most of my work now is office-based, um, but I am surrounded by a number of, you know, absolutely fabulous colleagues, uh, not uh, notwithstanding the folks on the phone here, but also in our office here and all the different partner organizations I work with. I'm in the Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate within the National Park Service. So that's the, the primary mission of, of most of the folks around me. Um, but again, working across partners is, is always eye-opening in terms of the subject matter areas. Um, paperwork versus people work. I do a lot of both actually, because uh, as a program administrator, I'm always working um, on su supporting uh, the program from you know, the paperwork side, but also having to interact um, both, you know, I guess I would say from the site level. So at a particular protected area site or an office to a state, to a region, to, you know, national in scope and I do international work too. So um, working conditions vary based on the sub the to topic that I'm working on. Um, but largely it's, I'm not out in the field like I used to be when I worked, you know, for agencies where that was my job to be out in the field. Um, I think you might find for the more seasoned uh, federal employees that they have experienced some of that as well. You transition um, as you are in the service longer into more administrative realms. Um, um, I do have the opportunity to still conduct uh, professional development capacity building training with partners, both in the US and elsewhere, uh, related to marine protected areas and other protected areas. We've supported projects related to human dimensions of wildlife and um, protected area planning and management activities, uh, workshops in, in that direction for uh, protected areas all around. Um, I, uh, my current position is a supervisory role. I, I currently don't have any, and that has been overlooking full-time employees, both you know in the federal service, some contractors um, and graduate fellows and interns, 
Um, currently, we don't have anyone in the in the national program office in any of those positions. Um, but the position is such that it does um, have those responsibilities. Um, so at any given moment, we may be um, having additional staff that could come in. Um, that's been a, a I think a, a, a positive experience in my uh, tenure as a federal employee is the opportunity to work with a number of different and supervise a number of different uh, staff. Um, so I, I find that to be um, a plus for the program and for my own personal interests. Um, um, I guess in terms of hours per week, that was one of the other <laughs> questions on there. Um, most weeks I'm working more than full time, so that's just how it is. Um, and uh, we're working on trying to alleviate some of that with some additional program funding uh, through the Department of the Interior currently. Um, I know you had mentioned also uh, page salary ranges, and I know there were some um, comments in the chat about just navigating the federal like USA job system, understanding how that works. And it is uh, a challenging, I, th I mean, it's structured pretty, pretty well, but it's, uh, it's not super easy to navigate. And you'll find if you look at a lot of different postings, um, in some areas, there's a lot of consistency. In some areas, there's there's a lack of consistency. So you really have to treat each announcement uh, on its own. Um, and then I guess you know salary ranges when you're coming out of graduate school, you know you're looking at uh, federal positions at least probably in the the GS 11, 12, 13 range, depending on where you are. If you're master's, PhD, postdoc, what have you. If you have prior experience in your um, background related to you know outside of the, uh, your academic uh, training that would influence, you know, the different types of positions you might apply for. Um, but that's pretty broad. Uh, and then, you know, there's a whole process for advancement as you're, once you become a federal employee that um, you can find more information about that on the um, OPM site, you know, pretty, pretty straight up. Um, I guess I'll leave it there and then I'm happy to answer questions as the panel session starts. But thank you. Great. Great to hear more about what it's like to be in your role. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, let's see. Next in this topic is, is Laurel Larson. Do you want to come in on day in a life? Sure, I, I will do that. And I also realized that when I introduced myself, I, I did not impart a nugget of wisdom. <laughs> there were so many good ones. But what I think I would say is don't be afraid of leadership opportunities. Uh, collaborative yet not afraid to make a decision once you have the information in hand. Um, I, I feel like I almost stumbled upon the role that I'm in now accidentally. It was a, a as a result of a connection that I had made years previously. A, basically, a former student of mine at Berkeley had gone to work at the Stewardship Council and um, knew that the Delta lead scientist position was coming up, uh, the advertisement was coming up and he reached out and encouraged me to apply. And uh, I didn't think my chances were that great. And I was very surprised to be named to the position. Had a lot of imposter syndrome around it initially as you know, the first woman in the role, considerably younger than my predecessors. Um, but it's something I've gained confidence in over the years and really come to enjoy. So with that, I think that's a good launch point into a, a typical day in my job. Um, just I'll start with a little anecdote. So when I was in graduate school, uh, working on, you know, in a flume lab, designing field equipment, whenever I had to call a technical service person to get help with an instrument or a tool that I was using, I would, I'm such an introvert, I would have to psych myself up for it for a few hours. And I just dreaded like making these phone calls to people I didn't know. But now that's a lot of what I do. Uh, a typical day in my life is um, that my meeting schedule usually starts somewhere between eight and nine. And I have hour, well, half hour to two hour long meetings um, pretty much until five o'clock, sometimes with a few breaks to get a little bit of work done. Um, but in, in this role, um, that 
like the, the mission of the Delta Science program that I lead is really to serve as an integrator and a coordinator of science that's focused on this particular region, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And it does involve a lot of coordination. Scott talked about the complexity of the environment society interface. And here in the Delta, we have over 100 agency and interagency groups with jurisdiction over the Delta. And so coordinating science and really producing a, a single body of, of science that is serving to inform decision makers requires a lot of, of talking to people, a lot of attending meetings to figure out what different collaborative groups are doing and, and how they might better work together. Um, but that said, you know, aside from having a lot of meetings, there really is no typical day because I wear so many different hats in this role and that's what keeps it really fun. So some of our projects are focused on pulling together science synthesis publications that look across a broad spectrum of projects and other publications and produce an authoritative synthesis on things like harmful algal blooms or invasive species management within the Delta. Um, we also do a lot of strategic development in order to prioritize uh, science funding initiatives and prioritize um, science, the science strategy for our entire science community. So uh, some of our larger projects really focus on putting together a, a near-term science action agenda and a longer-term science plan. Um, we participate in many different interagency groups that are focused on adaptive management, on invasive species management, and similar types of topics. Um, I also serve as a liaison to the Delta Independent Science Board, which one of my co-panelists, Diane McKnight, sits on. Um, and the Independent Science Board is a body that reviews science themes and science programs uh, within the Delta. Uh, they are associated with the Delta Stewardship Council, yet independent from the council. And they produce thematic reviews that are really visionary and guide much of our strategic development and guide a lot of a lot of the ways that we coordinate with uh, regulatory agencies across the state. Um, I'm quickly running out of time, so I'm going to skip to what working conditions are like. And I've noticed that in the Q&A, there's a lot of questions about remote work. Um, I would say that in federal and state agencies, uh, guidelines around remote versus non-remote work have been changing, and I expect they'll continue to change over the next few years. Um, we were operating completely remotely until of, until about maybe it was a year ago at this point when we started having more in-office days, but it was typically about one day per week. Uh, the latest guidance that just came out less than a month ago is that we're expected to be in the office two days per week. Um, but there's still a lot of flexibility as to when that occurs. Um, I, I always prioritize attending board meetings and council meetings and independent science board meetings in person. So um, I, I typically go in as, as needed to have important in-person interactions. But for um, a lot of what I do, uh, re remote work is, is quite possible. Um, I think I gave the impression earlier that I, I do mostly people work, but there is some paperwork that's involved still um, producing. A lot of that paperwork is producing products for science communication to various audiences. Um, but I also devote about 10% of my time to maintaining my laboratory research group at UC Berkeley. And so um, I, I spend quite a bit of time working with students on getting their, their publications out. A lot of that realistically gets pushed to evenings and weekend, e evenings and weekends, um, which kind of gets at the question of how many hours per week do I work? Um, this is also probably more than a full-time job, um, but I'll say I'm the sole parent of a three and a half year old, and that puts necessary constraints on my working time. So I'd say during the work week, I work maybe about 40 hours and I squeeze in extra time as I can after my son goes to bed or if he's taking a nap during the weekend or doing something with a friend, I'll squeeze in maybe an additional five hours per week. So not, not too much above and beyond a full-time job, but 
um, it, it is demanding. Um, and then I guess I would say in, in terms of supervisory roles, this is an interesting position. It's a leadership position, but I don't directly supervise any employees within the Delta Stewardship Council. So I have a counterpart who's a deputy executive officer for science who um, really takes over that role, but I work very closely with him to coordinate our priorities and our activities. Um, I oversee a lot of science. I, I have the final say on uh, funding decisions, on many of the documents that we put out, on charges for peer review panels that we run, but I don't directly su supervise employees. So I think I've used up my time and I'm happy to answer questions later. Wonderful, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, Laurel, sorry. Um, that was super neat to hear about everything that you're doing. I'm really enjoying this too. Um, next up is Tasso to talk on the same topic of a day in the life. <clears throat> Okay. Hey, hey, everyone. Um, so like I said in my intro, uh, the monitoring that we're conducting through a variety of cooperative agreements is the foundation of Recover's ability to inform SERP and track Everlays restoration. So keeping with that perspective, my work is divided into the three main categories. Uh, first, I'm ensuring that our monitoring is continuing as planned and that we're receiving quarterly and annual reports and associated data deliverables. Um, second, and probably most importantly, I'm coordinating meetings with a wider group of people from other agencies like the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, South Florida Water Management District, Seminole Tribe of Florida, Nikosuke Tribe of Florida, and others to review the information we're receiving from the monitoring and interpret any conclusions presented within the context of SERP. Um, we're also, we also review upcoming needs associated with future products and like reports and evaluations that Recover produces or contributes to. And also third, uh, thirdly, I'm involved in the development of those actual products um, that Recover uses to deliver and communicate scientific information to the public, policymakers, managers, and to CERC projects. Um, so in general, uh, my working condition is very collaborative. Um, that's one of the things that I like best about my job. I'm exposed to people from many different agencies, state and federal, uh, universities, and we're all focused on this common goal of Everglades rest restoration. So that's something I really enjoy. Um, as far as people versus paperwork, um, I would say that it's an even split um, between people versus paperwork. Uh, the people work involves is, is the coordinating aspect of my job. So um, like coordinating the meetings, uh, facilitating discussions. Um, and then the paperwork is mainly um, kind of documenting the, the products and, and conclusions generated from those discussions and those interactions, um, re generating reports, and then working through um, established procedures um, that are used to inform restoration. Um, I would say that communication is so critical. So effective communication um, across agencies, just from person to person, uh, that, that is something that I can't stress enough. Um, the majority of my job is spent at a computer, um, both in the office. Um, like Laurel said, we're, we're required to come in twice a week, generally all on the same day, at least for my, um, my immediate colleagues here at the core. Um, but there's a second day that we also, also come in. And um, I, I think those are really important. Um, so there are also opportunities to visit uh, sites with our PIs and, and also CERT projects. And um, when I first came on in 2020, COVID, COVID prevented all of this, um, but I think we're getting to the point where those will become more frequent. Um, my position is not a supervisory position, um, but there are supervisory positions within my, my branch and also within the planning and policy division. Um, so I think the three categories that I outlined earlier, so coordinating the monitoring, discussing and reaching consensus about the science and then delivering that information to SERP, um, each take about a third of my time, and this varies uh, through the course of the year as uh, certain deadlines and reports are, are coming due, um, but that's, I think, in general, pretty accurate. Um, I, I work all, pretty strictly 40 hours a week um, with few exceptions like conferences, workshops, special events. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's tough to, to do all the work that I need to do in 40 hours a week, um, but I really try to, to draw that line. 
Um, my salary is based on the grade scale system. Like I'm, I'm assuming everyone else's is here is. Um, I was hired on as a GS9. Now I'm a GS11. Um, and those specific salaries are available readily online. Um, and lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, in general, the, the core in the Jacksonville district works in several areas in addition to ecosystem restoration. So that's just my little bubble, but we also do flood risk management, coastal storm risk management and navigation. Uh, the core also has offices nationwide and overseas. And um, recently the core is, is uh, looking at hiring up to 150 positions so engineers, biological and physical scientists over the next few months, primarily, primarily to work on projects in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. However, vacancies are also anticipated at the Jacksonville District, which is where I work. And I actually have a flyer for Paige to distribute uh, to attendees uh, with some further information. So hopefully she can send that out. Um, but I think that pretty much that's my time that covers it. So I'd be happy to discuss anything further. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tesso. And um, we will definitely distribute any kind of job opportunities after the meeting. And, and we had done that the last time and pointed people to a variety of job boards where um, federal, these kinds of federal jobs are um, are posted. And, and we'll be sure to cycle that back around um, right after the meeting. Thank you so much for that reminder. I saw all those announcements come out and um, we've already been sending them through the LTR network and CESU as well. Um, the next category of, um, of questions is in this sort of career preparation arena. And I've been noticing quite a few questions about that in the, um, in the Q&A boxes as well. So I think we might be um, hitting on some of these uh, in the next um, four commentaries. So uh, Laura Brandt, um, do you want to go next on the career prep? How did you get to where you are today? Sure. Thanks, Evelyn. Again, I'm Laura Brandt. I'm now with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and my career path was not exactly direct. I knew I, knew I wanted to be in wildlife and do something like that, but I did not go straight through from my bachelor's to my master's to my PhD to my job. I, between my, my uh, bachelor's and my master's, I worked for a while at the Savannah River Ecology Lab. And then between my master's and my PhD, I worked again, I was actually working for University of Florida on a really cool project in Southwest Florida, looking at the effects of citrus development on fish and wildlife and fish and wildlife habitat where I was able to, I was the field manager for, we collected everything and just, it was a really cool wildlife project that then linked with GIS modeling um, and got to the end of that project and realized that the people that were getting all the credit and getting to do all the talking about the cool stuff we did were the people with the PhDs. So I, I, I then went on for my PhD and when I finished my PhD, I was working as a postdoc for University of Florida on alligator holes in the Everglades. And my major professor told me I had to apply for the job of senior biologist at uh, Locks Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge. Now, I had actually done my Ph.D. work on tree islands in Locks Hatchie Refuge. And so I knew I knew the system. I knew the people I'd been working in the Everglades. And I told him, I don't want to apply for a government job. I don't want to be an administrator. And he told me he, he, he was pretty blunt about it. And he said, you're being stupid. Um, it's a permanent job. You're on soft money right now. Try it and see if you like it. You can always do something else in five years. So I'm like, all right, fine, I'll do that. So when I when I applied for the job, um, they already knew me there. And so once they got, um, once my application got through the process of getting to them, it was a, it was a, I didn't have to do an interview or anything like that because they already knew who I was. And I told the guy, Mark Museus, that I said, you know, I see myself being here three to five years. And um, so I actually was at the refuge three to five years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and I was as the senior biologist there and was running the program, um, supervising uh, four other biologists plus interns. Um, that's where I first met Donato. He may tell you the story about that. Um, and basically, I felt like I had outgrown what I was doing at the refuge. And I was fortunate enough to have a supervisor who was a big picture thinker 
I had gotten involved with Everglades Restoration in the group that Tasso mentioned, the Recover Group, um, and started working on bigger ecosystem issues there and have kind of molded my job to bring the landscape scale thinking to the Fish and Wildlife Service through, through various routes. And so I have been able to kind of shape the direction of, of my position. Um, and, and as far as is there, a, what's the market for a career like this? I, th I think you have to, um, there are positions within the federal government that allow you to be flexible and to look at ecosystem restoration. And I think you'll see a lot of opportunities um, coming up with the increase in funding, like Tasso mentioned, with the core positions that are that are being opened. The Fish and Wildlife Service also has positions, mostly out west, because of the money that's been with the um, the BIL money, where there's been a lot of work and projects uh, out west. And so USA Jobs is really a good way to keep track of uh, what kinds of positions there are um, within that realm. Um, as far as what could I have done better to prepare me for my career? Well, I, I was a wildlife biologist. I wanted to study animals. I didn't do much thinking about people and people processes and uh, coordinating groups and things like that, or even for that matter, something that I'm, I'm really passionate about now, which is the decision-making aspect of it. And so I wish that when I was in graduate school that I would have taken advantage of classes that teach you about um, group processes, uh, group collaboration, facilitation, um, and even some decision analysis out of maybe the business schools or things like that that help you think about how to make better decisions about things. I had I had a number of role models, and I guess the, the thing I, I would say is that what I tried to do is when I worked with people, I tried to look at the things that I liked that they did and the things that I didn't like that they did. And so I would try to emulate the things that I liked and not do the things that I didn't like that they did. And I have a couple of stories about that if, you know, but we probably don't have time for that. Um, and then do you still have to keep tra getting training for what you do? I think, you know, for, for all of us in natural resource management and especially with how things are changing with the environment, it's a continual learning cycle. And so I would say if you're not getting training in some way or another, then you're, you're getting behind. And that training can be informal. It can be through self-learning and reading. It can be um, official training through courses or uh, seminars or things like that within Fish and Wildlife Service. Fish and Wildlife Service has been a great place for me for work. Um, they really support their people. Um, they really believe in growing the, um, the community within the service and providing training opportunities. Um, with that said, it all depends on who your supervisor is as to how easy or hard that is to do. And I would say that's, that's probably the biggest thing is that, that um, the agency in and of itself is very supportive of all of these things. Um, and you, you need to find the people that can help you uh, achieve what you want within the organization. I think I used up my time. Well, that was super helpful. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, next up uh, is Donato um, Sarad on the uh, um, career preparation topic as well. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, so the first question on the list is, how did you get your job and what experiences led you to this position? Well, that would be the compendium of my life. Uh, Laura said hers was an odd path. Mine is a ridiculously odd path. And I have to take you all the way back to when I was 12 and I got my first Commodore 64 and I learned how to code in QBasic. So that was like the launching platform for me. Before that, I wanted to be a scientist because there was Spider-Man shooting webs and in the lab making chemicals. To, so I wanted to be that, that Spider-Man character, but once I got that computer, that really changed my reality. Um, <clears throat> from there, I went, you know, I got to, I got to go to a high school that was known as a magnet high school and they attract some of the highest level um, people in their professions. I was in business finance at the time and we had a remarkable economist, actually world renowned economist at the time who would teach our classes. 
And she basically was the platform that launched me to even consider going to college and, and, and continuing on in that path. And, and she actually told me I needed to get into what's called agriculture economics. So that's how I went from business finance to anything related with the sciences again. So now I'm at Ag Econ. Um, I did my time there, got my PhD, I mean, my undergrad degree. And while I was there, I spent a lot of time with all of the professors. Um, this is like 1995 and Windows operating system, Windows 95 just came out. And remember, I just told you I was into computers. So I was the only person in there who was in the computer. So I went to every professor and they were always calling Donato, Donato, Donato. I don't know how to do this, 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 and this. So it gave me a lot of opportunities to be engaged with the professors. And ultimately they made me a work study student, which kept me from having to go get a job and work out in the world away from the actual education process. So that I spent a lot of time on campus learning and studying. Um, from there, I, I in my, so right now I'm at AggieCon. At the end of my undergrad degree, I decided two of my electives were going to be in psychology. And then my psychology professor was like, oh my God, you'd be the greatest psychologist ever. Let's send you to a master's program. And then he sent me to Florida and University. So at the time I was back in Louisiana, they sent me over to Florida um, A&M University and they were giving me a full ride for my master's program. I spent a year and a half doing that and I quickly realized psychology wasn't for me. It's really subjective. There are no actual right answers. You can't do any kind of calculations to get the answer. And so I was only making Bs. I could never make the As and I was always in conflict. Um, so then I was lucky enough to find a young man who was defecting from the program and went into this new evolving program called Environmental Science Institute at Florida Anim University. And he introduced me to the leader of that program, Larry, Dr. Larry Robinson. And he immediately sucked me into the program and he launched me into radiation health physics. So I now <laughs> went from psychology to radiation health sciences. And so then I spent the next two years getting a master's degree in radiation health physics, developing radon detectors that we could deploy submersibly in the water column. So this now introduced me back to the environment. <clears throat> um, while I was finishing my master's program, my the person who would become my dissertation advisor, she picked me up and said, well, you did really well in the radiation detection field and you were out in the, the, the environment deploying stuff. So she picked me up on our team and she would become my professor of aquatic ecology. So then I would spend the next few years learning all about aquatic ecology and actually more specifically about biogeochemistry because now I'm out in the Apalachicola Bay up in North Florida, I'm collecting sediment cores and trying to understand how things have changed over time. So I'm getting the geochronology of the sediments and understanding how the chemistry has been shifted by human anthropogenic impacts. So it's been a really exciting uh, trek. And so now I'm getting to the end of my PhD program and, and you know, she, my advisor is like, what are we gonna do next? And she starts talking about jobs, but I had been moonlighting for the last year and a half up in the physics department on the second floor. And because of my radiation background, we were building a cosmic detect radiation detector. <clears throat> and she found out about that and she lost it. And this guy named Matthew Harwell was looking for a scientist to come and take over a monitoring program up in the refuge, which was a million dollar project. And then she got wind of that. She chased him down, told him I was this excellent scientist that was gonna graduate in a couple of months and I needed to pick him up. So they picked me and you know, I was supposed to go through this process you guys are asking about on, on this, the questions about uh, the, the application procedure. So I did all of that. I, I didn't make it through that process. I missed some technical thing and I didn't make it through the, I think somebody called them bean counters or the, some kind of counters. I didn't make it through that process. So they created another route to make me a postdoc. And I ended up with the University of Erasmus, I mean, University of Miami with Erasmus. And um, that basically launched my career here. I was supposed to only come down here for two years. Like I said, this is 20 years later. <laughs> so I ended up just moving slowly up this chain of, 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 of the process for growing in the, the career I started um, in 2008, I actually got picked up. So I came down here in 2005, got picked up by the National Park Service in 2008 as a GIS specialist. Um, 
GIS is some of those things that I learned on my own, right? I set, asked questions. I had a GIS specialist working on our team, but the products that were being produced, I, I constantly had conflict with, and I, I wasn't happy about the product, so I had to go learn all of this stuff myself. My team started turning to me for the products because it was easier to work with me and get the products done. The young lady who was run, doing the job at the time decided to move north. I got picked up for that position. Um, and so I did that for about two years. And, and then there was this person who was in a position that was higher at a GS-13. And um, I had basically been doing most of the work for him because I, I like doing statistical analysis. I was hanging with a guy named Mike Walden, who was the god of data analysis. And he taught me and trained me pretty much everything on the job for the, the previous years. And I was applying it and doing all of the work. And I was recognized for that. And the guy was removed for saying something bad about the sparrows. Guys, never when you come down here, talk adversely about sparrows. You're supposed to protect the sparrows. So he came out here and he said, why are we protecting this one bird? Oh man, they got rid of him really quick. Um, and then I was able to take over that role. And I actually been in that position ever since. Um, I, I actually had a team of six for a long time. And Laura was one of those masters that was on this team. Um, like she told you her story already. So I lost her over time, but um, I never got to replace her. Right now I'm actually literally a team of two from that initial team of six. And we're trying to rebuild it right now. Um, so that's the how I got here. And I kind of think that tells you a lot of the experience that I got to get this position. So I said at the beginning, one of my take home things, themes is don't turn down anything, do everything, be passionate about it, dive deep into it. I'm not sure, I wasn't looking at the time, so I don't know how long I've been talking. Tell me to get off when it's my time. What is the job market like for this career? Um, Laura mentioned USAjobs.gov. I did a Google real quick for the ecologist position and that came back with 25 positions. Um, and like I said, like somebody else said earlier, this thing goes really fast. These things are literally like two week chunks of time and you're gonna be seeing other ones pop up on a daily basis. So you gotta stay vested in there. Additionally, I've joined a bunch of the server links that provide you the jobs. I did that back in undergrad. So I still get a bunch of those coming to me on a daily basis, I received three or four job announcements for ecologist position. I also joined LinkedIn. LinkedIn sends me at least two or three of them um, on, on a daily basis. I Googled to find out what the market was gonna be like in the future. And basically it says, based on the US Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics, it's been growing at around 8%, consistent with most of the other fields. Um, so we're adding around 7,300 jobs uh, uh, to the field on an annual basis right now. So we're growing, ecologists are strong, and we're starting to be more and more representative. Uh, what would you have done to prepare better for your career? Oh, I'm over time. All right, thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you so much. If we have time um, later, we'll, we can address some questions to you, but go ahead, Evelyn. Sorry, Donato, that was awesome. And yeah, um, I do think we, we let's try to keep to three minutes or so um, moving moving forward, just to make sure we have plenty of time for um, the Q&A wonderful questions that are rolling in. And folks, pl please continue to um, bring your uh, questions into the, into the Q&A tab, okay? We're seeing them there and um, we love that. Uh, again, thank you so much, Donato. Great, great history there. Um, so interesting. Uh, next up is Adrian also uh, to speak on the preparation pathway. Yeah, so I will continue the theme of not taking a linear career path that was presented to most of us in graduate school. So I hope everyone's kind of getting this theme, right? The linear career path is um, not the majority experience. Um, so between finishing my PhD and getting the job I'm in now, I took a three-year pause on research to work on ocean and climate policy in DC. So um, when I was faced with that linear path of searching for a um, postdoc once I was nearing the end of my PhD, it just didn't feel right. I couldn't put, put words around it back then. I can now. Back then I couldn't put words around it. but I followed my gut. And so I went off script and I applied to the Canal Sea Grant Policy Fellowship, 
um, that's run by NOAA. And it was this, the start of three years that I spent in DC um, working on legislative affairs. And um, this was, you know, a door that opened to me that I had no idea where it would leave, lead me, right? I had no idea, but it felt right and it felt like a good opportunity. It felt like I was going to learn something new. And that experience gave me um, two things, two main things. So first, it, it gave me an appreciation for how science informs policy and how science priorities are developed, which are perspectives that I use now in my science position now that I'm back in, in research. So that was a really important experience for me. Um, that ex this, the, the experience also led me to the ocean carbon community. My PhD was in coastal biogeochemistry, focusing on nutrients. And there was something missing in that community for me. And I knew it when I found the ocean carbon community that that was what I was missing. I was missing global scale collaboration on a big problem. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, it was, alt you know, the ocean carbon community is just ultimately the, the um, community I was looking for when I was finishing my PhD and looking at postdocs. So, um, you know, I would have never guessed that that door would have led to that, never guessed. But I, like I said, I followed my gut. Um, and there were, um, and I also wanna talk a little bit about um, academia versus a federal science position. I saw a question about that in the chat because I definitely um, thought a lot about that too. And what's cool about my position as a federal scientist within NOAA, I can kind of have best, the best of both worlds because I'm also an affiliate professor at University of Washington. I advise PhD students. Um, so I definitely um, have a really close connection to, uh, to academic science and the, the universities. And strategically that, you know, um, if you're interested in working in a, a federal science position, often there are postdoc fellowship opportunities that are um, strategic to, to, to search for. And um, within NOAA, there are cooperative institutes that are located at universities that are a co cooperative relationship between NOAA and the university. And they often have postdoc fellowships and that's a strategic way to kind of get into um, the, the, federal, the federal science pipeline. Um, so I just um, wanted to mention that because that is the way that I eventually got into this job is I was first a postdoc with that cooperative institute and worked with that cooperative institute for several years and then a federal position opened up and I applied for it and got it. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adrienne. Um, our next um, commenter on the career preparation track is uh, our theme is Scott Haggerty. Thanks, Evelyn. So I think I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions into one answer. Okay. And those, how, did, how did you get your job and what experience led you to the position? What would you have done better to prepare for your career? And did you have a role model? And what advice would you give to your kids? Um, I will start by saying, having been a practicing scientist in the Everglades doing research to, to help Everglades restoration, there were several instances and times in your life where you run across um, a person or a situation or something said that sticks with you that really changes your life. <clears throat> and I can point to, th I'll, I'll have many examples, but I'll point to three. So number one is just always be open to collaboration and thinking like knowing other people and what they do and regardless of where they are. And my postdoc advisor from the University of St. Andrews when I was in Scotland, he and I were on a train and he struck up a conversation with the man sitting across from across from him. And it turns out that that guy 
was a physicist from the University of Aberdeen who worked on holograms. And so we were sedimentologists looking at erosion in intertidal mudflats underwater. And by the time we got off the train, we had written a proposal to submit to the equivalent of the UK's National Science Foundation to establish, to look at whether or not we could design a hologram, a camera to produce a hologram of sediment erosion. And this is the type of thing where this was just pure chance, just talking to someone, being open and receptive to ideas. And that never left me, right? And so you can walk around and like, you can talk to any scientist. Everybody will teach you something about life if you're open to it. And I think it was, somebody had mentioned earlier about, I think it was Laura about, you know, every time you we work with somebody, you either have, <laughs> there's the good qualities in them and there's the bad qualities in them. I've worked for some really bad people, but I've always taken the positive away, right? There's always something that's come away with that. <clears throat> in the Everglades, two, two things kind of really shaped my career and where I went. <clears throat> One was we were working on the DECOM physical model. This was in the early planning stages before we had permission to build the structure at the L67 a canal. If you don't know it, don't worry about it. But the most important thing was that we needed a water quality permit and a federal judge had put a moratorium on water quality permits in the Everglades. And so we were trying to convince our attorney um, in the Office of General Counsel that this was a good idea and he needed to go fight for us. And so we laid out the science argument and Kirk looked at us, this is Kirk Burns, looked at us and said, I don't care. And that statement can be taken two ways. You can get like, angry and walk out the door, or you could ask the question, why don't you care? Which is what I did. And he came around and said, Scott, I can't argue science in, federal, in front of a federal judge. I need the legal reason, right? And with the legal reason, it gets you thinking about how all this actually works. And so we sat down and we thought through, what do we need to do from a legal perspective in order to get the water quality permit? Eventually, we did it. The structure was built, and that experiment continues to this day, even though it was supposed to be decommissioned after two years. <laughs> it's, some, it's amazing that it's still there. <clears throat> the second one was attending an Everglades climate change meeting um, where we were asked on a bunch of different ecosystems, what is the one thing you would tell a manager to protect an ecosystem in the face of climate change? And all the wetland scientists said, just keep it wet. Just make it a wetland. Keep it a wetland. We don't care what it is. Just keep it a wetland <laughs> at the bare minimum. <clears throat> but there was a group of scientists who said, oh, well, you know, we need more money. We need to do more research. We need to do this. We need to do that. There's a bunch of uncertainty. We can't tell you. And one of the, the big managers stood up and said, I get it. I understand it. But tomorrow I make a decision. Whether you, whether you tell me now or you don't, tomorrow I'm going to make a decision. And so that's always resonated with me to say, you know, tomorrow somebody's making a decision and you're either at the table or not. And you have to be willing to say what you know and lay out the uncertainty factors. A decision maker is skilled at making decisions and they will make a decision and they will take the information that you provide them. So <clears throat> all of those instances kind of really helped shape where I am and how I got here. Um, I think in terms of better preparing for a career, um, I think Laura talked about, you know, attending classes on decisions. Science policy interface is all about people. This is a people game. It's not really a science game. It's a people game. You need to know how to interact with people. You need to be able to negotiate. You need to be able to deal with high conflict. You need to be able to walk into a room that can be tense and irate and work to cool it down to make progress. The science is fantastic, but science is only one part of the equation in decision-making. And so understanding people, taking classes in high conflict, negotiations are, are things that I wish I would have done sooner rather than later. <clears throat> um, and so I'll end with what advice do would I give to my kid um, about science or about a career? It's like, one is be passionate, do something that you enjoy, do something that you love getting out of bed in the morning and putting your feet on the ground, but, but never stay stagnant, change if it's in your heart. I have worked with some fabulous introverts whose 
who did amazing science. And as a manager, you just let them in their room, close the door because that's what they did, right? They loved it. They didn't want to be in the public. I've worked with some crazy extroverts who have really kind of helped push things. But it's, it's again, just like be passionate and be true to yourself. And if you are a good manager, a good supervisor, a good mentor, a good person will recognize it and they'll admire you for it and they'll figure a way out to, to kind of bring you into the fold. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Scott. That was so inspirational. <laughs> really, thank you so much. Um, our last category before we get to questions is um, challenges and benefits of your position. And we'll start with Grizel. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, I will I'll focus, my, focus my, my remarks around the, the benefit uh, piece of, of that theme. Uh, um, in my remarks around what is it um, that I like about working with the Forest Service? What's, uh, what I like best about my job and what are the most rewarding aspects of the job? And for the first question, I'll um, tackle or provide three nuggets of information. One would be that um, it has allowed for the development of my uh, career within the agency. I started uh, working with the uh, International Institute of Tropical Forestry uh, in Puerto Rico in 2000, and I started serving as a postdoctoral scientist and later evolved into a permanent research ecologist position that later um, turned out to be uh, uh, an opportunity to be the director of a field station um, and then the project leader of the research and development unit, uh, and then into assistant director uh, for the institute, and later the opportunity to be the institute director, um, that during the span of uh, 23 years. Um, and now as the director of the institute, I can help guide the science, the administration, and the communication of research related to tropical forests and grassland currently uh, taking place in over 10 countries and in collaboration with 45 institutions and over 150 scientists. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico and during my whole career since undergraduate and graduate programs, I have had the privilege to study and research uh, Puerto Rico's natural resources. So working for an agency that allows for the development of my career is quite important for me. The other piece uh, of why I, I like my job is that really it's a fascinating place to study. <laughs> uh, being in Puerto Rico, it is it's a unique region uh, within, within the country. We have high biodiversity, endemic and endangered species. You can find dry to wet forests, uh, tropical forests, diversity of soils, 10 of the 12 soil orders that are found across the world you can find in, in this 100 by 35 mile uh, island have abundant rivers and stream um, and have the opportunity to study threatened coastal to um, mountain ecosystem like cloud forests at the top of the mountain. At the same time, uh, there's challenges of low uh, food and fiber security, low adaptive capacity to extreme events and extreme vulnerability to hurricanes and, and droughts. But uh, being in Puerto Rico, uh, we provide for the eastern southernmost uh, most biologically diverse forest in the national forest system in the U.S. And it has been recognized as a source for forest resources in the days of the Spanish crown in the 1500s and has a cultural resources that um, go back to the indigenous uh, people that inhabited the island. The other aspect that I like best about my job is that aligns both my personal and professional values to that of the overall mission of the, of, of the agency. I love the mission of conservation of the Forest Service. I appreciate the natural resources that we have and the role they provide for the well being of society. So I like the fact that the Forest Service includes the management of the national forest system, but also supports state, private, and tribal forestry, as well as international cooperation and research and development. These are all we call within the Forest Service deputy areas, and they all play an important role in delivering the services to the public. So I value the, the role of science and research within this effort, and, and I strongly feel that the work within the Forest Service can make a difference in people's lives because we strive to provide the best available science for the management of 193 millions of acres of forest and lands uh, across the nation. 
And then uh, some of the most rewarding uh, aspects of my job is that I've been able to see the contributions of diverse people uh, across uh, diverse people across uh, working in natural resources conservation, particularly women uh, within the scientific positions uh, within the Forest Service. We had 130 female scientists, and in at the institute there are five of them. So there are landscape ecologists, research ecologists, research social scientists, and they're trying to produce cutting edge science for the purpose of increasing our understanding and conservation of, of tropical forests. I, I also I find quite rewarding our ability and, uh, to make and strengthen connections for the purpose of natural resources conservation. That being um, just the connection between arts and science collaborations as a way to explore different uh, tools for conservation education and outreach, or maybe think about the connection between the forestry sector and food and, and agriculture sector. For example, Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico, 85% of the food consumed is imported, and this situation creates extreme vulnerability to food security, particularly in the face of uh, natural disasters. Fortunately, uh, agro uh, forestry practices and garden and community forests are being established in these urban settings in programs uh, within the state, tribal, uh, and private uh, unit within the institute help provide for this uh, new way of, of uh, conserving and, and providing for food security. So making the connection between forest and food security. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Grisel. Interesting background. That's so cool to learn more about what you face in your position. And um, thank you. Sherry, um, you're up next to talk about challenges and, and um, benefits, all the great things about your position. Thanks. Um, I'm also for service and will echo some of the things Grisel talked about. And just to give people a little bit of background, Forest Service has two branches. There's the National Forest System and there's research and development. Grizel and I are both in research and development, but both branches of Forest Service hire master's level and PhD scientists. The National Forest um, Service folks are much more involved in management monitoring of specific forests, whereas we, the research covers much more broadly. And just as a heads up, if you are a PhD and interested in doing research, look for position titles that have research in them, which are GS-12 and above. So um, what do I like best about my job? Um, working and interacting with the natu nat natural resource managers and collaborative groups, as well as energy I get from mentoring graduate students and postdocs is really, is really what I love. Um, working for an agency that has responsibility for managing large tracts of public land is a responsibility. And I've, I've worked with this agency as a young seasonal and was really happy to be able to come back as a scientist and contribute and help address research problems. I do a lot of research with partners, um, collaborations, co-production, all of these terminology. And, and I think that's probably similar across many of our agencies. I, I think it's a benefit because I like those kind of collaborations. Some people might think it's a challenge. Um, speaking of challenges, being in a federal agency, any of us would comment that the bureaucracy can be really challenging, sometimes more so than others. Um, but a lot depends on who, who you are and who your teams are and putting, and the, the benefits of teamwork are just overweigh the um, downside of the challenges if you can have it be in good teams. Um, in the Forest Service, at least it's, and it really varies across agencies. Our, fed, our salaries for permanent employees are covered, but we have to come up with our own research funding through grants, collaborations, proposals, and a lot of my research addresses basic forest stream interactions, really basic ecological questions, but also really applied management issues um, that affect streams, riparian zones. Um, my research isn't just focused on public lands, though, because it's relevant across all lands in our checkerboard of, of ownerships across the West. So I work quite a bit on private and industrial forests, too. 
The rewarding aspects of my jobs are doing the research and being a problem solver, whether it's for field work, whether it's for issues, whether it's for policy questions, and trying to learn how the world works and formally explore ecological questions. And, and coming back to the teams, the smart, kind people um, who are energetic, curious, are really great to work with. Um, our offices are based on Oregon State University campus. And so I, like others, I have the benefit of being, having a courtesy faculty position with the university, as well as being a federal scientist. And then to close, there was a question about balancing time between career and family. And I'd probably broaden that to be work-life balance because there are always a variety of opportunities, influences, constraints in our lives. Having a family, a partner, or a major hobby is going to influence our career decisions and opportunities. But I'm a believer that academia and research are really good environments for being a parent. I was a single mom for many years as a graduate student and postdoc, and I really appreciated the flexibility during those years. And our agencies are generally very supportive of work-life balance. My postdocs, graduate students have all started families while working with me. And, and that makes it fun. That's just part of what we do. Everyone has different stages for how much time, how many hours in a week they want to work, they can work, they are willing to work, and it and it there's trade-offs for all of those things. Um, I think that's all for me. I'll pass back to Evelyn. Wonderful, Sherry. Thank you so much, um, Diane. You're next on the topic of challenges and benefits. Well. Uh, Thank you very much. And um, I wanted to echo what Sherry and uh, others have said about the value of teams within the uh, my research uh, experience as a research hydrologist with the USGS. And uh, I and wanted to answer one of the questions about, are you really able to make a bigger difference in the federal government in terms of addressing environmental and ecological challenges? and uh, one of my mentors at the USGS, uh, I remember what he said about never undervalue making forward progress on a tough problem. And we have, you know, your, the work in the Everglades and in the Bay Delta system, these are tough problems of being part of a team that's making some progress and figuring things out. And there'll be breakthroughs where some of the science you've figured out or suddenly get implemented. And that's really exciting um, and rewarding. I would also say that it was very rewarding for me, both at the USGS and at the National Science Foundation to be involved in uh, providing science input to some large programs as a scientist with the USGS, I was involved in planning the ecological components of the National Water Quality Assessment Program of the USGS, which really was important in terms of integrating across the states and understanding issues of nutrient enrichment and uh, contaminants at the national scale. And when I was at NSF, um, I was able to be involved with launching a, a new, it was called a big idea of the navigating the new Arctic to conduct research, understanding change in the Arctic program. And in both of these cases, uh, learning about the ins and outs and ups and downs about how the agency actually works, what's the culture of the agency is really key to having that kind of impact and working as a team. And so this is one thing to keep in mind in terms of remote work is learning how to navigate and find the, the breakthrough point or developing your team, it's hard to do. Maybe younger people are better able to do that over, over Zoom as we are now. But uh, being present, uh, I remember my dad telling me the world is run by the people who show up. And so showing up and engaging and however you can do that, is really important to achieve some of these goals that we're talking about in terms of the federal government and the state government. So I think I'll leave it at that and be glad to answer other questions. Perfect. Thanks so much, Diane. And last but not least, Chad Redwine, um, also on this topic, and then we'll get into some Q&A. 
Thanks, Evelyn. I'll be brief. Um, my favorite thing about my job is um, my intent, my intellect, my spirit, and my emotions are often aligned. Um, you know, I know exactly why I'm doing the work I'm doing. I have a strong desire to do it, and uh, and when I'm out in the field, my I'm aligned with my physical body as well. So it's you know it's rare to have a career where you know not everybody loves their career or loves every aspect about their career. Um, it's it's what I've seen with my with my you know members of my family is there's a lot of people that have careers that are rewarding in some sense and are very costly in others. I found that being a scientist is a good you know has a lot of rewards. The, the costs aren't so bad. I mean the costs really are the costs that I impose on myself. So. Um, the least thing I like about my job, um, well, one of the things I love about my job is that when we discover something, as a scientist, it's true. Right? It may be five years before the decision makers realize how to implement that truth or how to improve the world by taking advantage of this true thing that we've discovered. That's one of the things I like least about my job. Um, there's been times when I've discovered some things, I've discovered facts that uh, very clearly are true to me, and it takes 10, 20 years for the policy and management and culture to come around and implement that with clarity. Um, you know, being patient um, for allowing the vision of everybody else who's involved in resource and land management um, to become aware of and to integrate science and discoveries, discoveries of science. Um, it's challenging sometimes to be patient with that. Um, but I don't, I don't really see that there's an option. I think it's very important that we, you know, stay focused and stay patient. Um, the most stressful aspect of my job, um, part of it is lack of control. Um, really, the most stressful parts are, I stress myself out, frankly. It's how I respond to the uncertainties. It's how I respond to the lack of control. Those I, I cause, you know, how did I say it like this? Um, I was a person, I had a personality before I became a scientist. Um, you know, we have to be true to our personalities and who we are. Um, you know, my basic personality, my basic personality does fit science, the practice of science very well, the implementation of science, and, and I've heard several other members talk about this you know, the interpersonal process or all the need for facilitation or, you know, all the different cognitive, you know, dynamics that there are or met other people's minds. Um, I find those things to be interesting, but sometimes they're very stressful, uh, particularly when there's a driving decision um, that needs to be made. And um, so the, what kind of problems do I deal with? That's, I, that's my career path is here because there are problems to be solved. I, we solve problems of all types and all scales. Um, that's one of the main things that's that's compelled, propelled me through my career path is my willingness and ability to solve problems of any type. And uh, my, you know, and as, as others have said, you know, my willingness to show up and even provide my imperfect solution as 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 an option that decision makers can can engage in and can use. Um, that's something I, that's I personally I feel like I'm I'm best at. And I've heard a lot of other people here. You know, I heard Laurel talk about you know you know, solving puzzles and, you know, learning thing, you know, solving puzzles and, and dealing with patterns at his young age, that's exactly how I am. I'm still doing the same thing. You know, I mean, if I wasn't solving problems for my work, living, I'd be on my iPhone playing Wordle probably all day. You know, um, the most rewarding aspect of the job is the ongoing personal transformation that I'm that I'm compelled to engage in and, and the reflection of the transformation of the ecological systems that I'm embedded in. Um, and for me, it's, 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 you know, solving a, finding a solution is wonderful. Um, initiating a transformation of how people, of a basic orientation of how people are oriented to a system or how people interact with the system. That's the, for me, that's by far the most, the most um, satisfactory. I get the most satisfaction out of that, of that transformational experience, whether it's individualized or in a group. Um, how do I balance between my career and family? Um, I, I do a lot of improvisation, you know, like uh, sometimes, you know, I would say, I realized this when my daughter was four, she said she was, she was telling me that her favorite show was Powerpuff Girls. And, uh, you know, each of the Powerpuff Girls has a special, has a special, uh, 
um, has a special power. And they're called there. And, and my, my daughter told me that my special power was lecturing. Um, so I integrate my, my life, my family life with my work life. Um, sometimes it comes off well, you know, other times, you know, I could probably let go of the work life a little bit more. Um, for me, you know, finding that balance for the next few years, I'm, I'll be 50 this year. Um, that's, it's becoming even more and more important um, as I get older. And it's actually, it's getting nicer, honestly, as I get older, it's, um, I feel, I feel more confident that what I've learned is enough and I can take free time. And, but I would say to you, all of you who are young, what you know now is enough. You can take free time. Um, you don't need to wait until you're 50 to have permission to take a vacation. You should definitely do that. And uh, if I could change something about my job, what would it be? Um, basically every day I would fast forward 20 years. If I could just get into the future when many of these things are solved and we're, we're dealing with things more rationally, there's still gonna be problems left to solve them. Um, but that's, you know, if, if there was something I could change, I would give myself a time machine. Cause that's, that's really the challenge of being a scientist is I think we're, we recognize issues long before they're recognized or understood by others and implemented ultimately. And, uh, and there's, you know, I think all of us here, you know, we tend to race towards solutions. That's one of the reasons why we're, we're focused as scientists. That's probably one of the reasons why many of you on, online are, have chosen to be scientists. Um, I would just say like this, I would say, give you the quote from my um, father-in-law. He says, Jed, be patient. And when you feel like you've run out of patience, be more patient. So uh, that's, my, that's my recommendation, over. Wonderful, Jed. There were lots of hearts flying in your comments, and um, I just thank you so much. Um, well, there are wonderful questions, 35 of them in the Q&A, and um, many that have been addressed uh, to some degree in the answered box as well. Um, I noticed two areas of questioning that got a lot of thumbs up, and they're kind of related, and they have to do with um, applying for and landing a federal job. And um, the first question there, um, I think it was, yeah, that, um, you know, tips navigating the application process for determining whether you're even competitive for the position um, and that you get into that place where you, um, uh, you know, or actually have your application seen by a human reviewer. Um, could you shed light into how um, you connect with a real person within an agency who might be posting a job. Um, and then sort of the second tier of questioning further down about the actual interview. And, you know, once you do get asked to come for an er interview, are there um, any tips that you all would have on how to conduct yourself? So uh, um, Donato, you raise your hand for the, you know, do you have advice on how to apply uh, and, and, and make sure your application gets seen by a person in the system? So I wanted to comment on this one because of the beat the bot concept. And I, I called it bean counters earlier because that's how it was introduced to me when I was younger. Um, I, I've recently actually from a hiring positions perspective uh, found out none of that's the reality. What we actually are dealing with is some humans that are working from the people who are trying to hire the positions guidelines. So that, that announcement that you see when you go to usajobs.gov is the work that the actual person who's trying to hire for that position has put a lot of effort in to try to communicate what they're seeking as an employee. So the first and most important thing is to review that announcement in thorough detail. You need to make sure that you have captured every potential keyword that's in there in your resume. And you can't just copy the information that's in the position announcement. You have to incorporate it into your resume. And you can't fake it. So when I was talking to the people who did the reviewing process for my first round of trying to hire, she defended her, her selection of the people that could get reviewed by me profusely. And she said she picked the people who were the most honest. She didn't pick all the people who scored the highest letters. She picked the people who scored the highest letters and then had the defense of it in their resumes. So 
I want to dispel this rumor about beating a bot. There's no bot. There are humans. And you're dealing with a person who's trying to hire and they have to go through this process for the USAjobs.gov. Later on, there's somebody who asked about, is there somebody you can go around so you can contact the people directly? For, for the DOI, we don't have that process. We do have to go through this usajobs.gov approach. Over. Thanks, Donato. Um, great advice. Sherry, do you have other thoughts? Yeah, that um, I totally agree with Donato. And it's also an exercise in describing what you do to someone who is not a scientist. And that's really, and that's a good practice for everything else we do. So the people are looking for keywords, granted, but but help them understand what you do and why you are a good match for this position. Um, sometimes it, some positions do have a person's name listed. I've been, I do a lot of hiring. I'm a supervisory research ecologist and, and people contact me directly and that's fine. And I can give, a, give them more information if that is listed there. And the other thing is to be prepared and to do as much background, just like any interview, you have to be, you want to be as informed as possible when you go into an interview so that you're not just worrying about whether you can um, bring your dog to work or if you can work remotely, but really talking about the position and understanding what they're trying to do with this role. Great. Um, Diane. I also wanted to say that one trend that I've seen is some federal agencies, at least the USGS, limit the number of applications that they will review to 50 or 100. And so the announcement can go out and then they can hit that 50 or 100 mark very quickly. And so you have this balance between um, trying to get the right words in and really doing a good job while the clock is ticking and the the application limit could be reached. So it's 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 tricky. And uh, I really encourage people to stay on top of um, that scene. And then the other point I've heard is that some of the positions that are in more remote offices may have fewer people applying and that's uh, you know, maybe you want to live in Moab, Utah for a couple of years. That could be cool. You're speaking a little bit to this, um, Diane, but um, there was a question about timeline. Um, you know, what the typical timeline is from the point of applying to like actually finding out and then interviewing and, and landing the job. I mean, it, is there any expectation that you could guide people to? And I, I've them? seen it very all over the place. Okay. I mean, sometimes okay. by the time the uh, job goes out on USA Jobs, Jobs, they needed somebody six months ago. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and anyway. Yeah. Great. How about Laura? Did you have comments? Yeah. So following up on the on the doing your homework and paying attention to what's going on, I, I, I think, you know, if you're looking for a job, you want to have your, your set stuff um, ready in USA Jobs so that you can tailor it for the job description. But you need to know whether or not what steer job series you're qualified for. And you need to make it perfectly clear within that application that if you don't have, say, say like I didn't have nine credits of botany to start with. So I wasn't originally qualified as a wildlife biologist. So I had to get that extra three credits of botany. So make sure you understand what the job series are and then what their course requirements are, as well as what your um, experience might might qualify for that. And as far as timing, it, it really is variable. I mean, and, and sometimes the process can go quickly, sometimes not so much. If there's a lot of applications, they'll do what they call panels. So it's another layer. Um, if there aren't as many people that, that apply, then it might, it might move, move more quickly. Um, and so there's that first screening where you're put in a pile that's qualified or not qualified. And that's where it's really important what's on your, your resume and what you've submitted. And that's where Donato was, was talking about making sure you read that application and, and, and communicate it that your skills meet when they say, have experience doing ecological modeling. So, so um, yeah. Great. 
Um, thank you, Laura and uh, Grizel and Diane um, Grizel for. Sure. Um, if you're interested in working with the federal government, I'll also recommend to look at internships within the agencies. Um, for example, a program uh, called Research uh, Assistant Program, RAP, uh, the short version. Uh, when you work a particular number of hours at the end of that time, you get a certificate that then uh, could be used um, as if you were already within the federal government, so you will not have to be uh, competing with the rest of the public, or you might be able to use a direct hiring authority. So kind of uh, bypass the USA job uh, application process by, by going through this direct hire authority. Great, um, and I just wanna interject before um, bringing in Diane again on this. Uh, let's make sure we talk to, the uh, question that's in here a few times about um, transitions between um, federal postdoc positions and permanent positions and what how that might transpire. Um, yeah, Diane. <clears throat> yes, I, I wanted to uh, address that because one advantage of if you have a postdoc with the federal government, sometimes you will have opportunities to meet people in other offices around the country and uh, don't uh, pass up any of those opportunities because that can be uh, really useful in terms of making connections. The good impression you could make at the office where you are, which, which may not have an opening, can lead to a not someone you're being uh, in a good position for a position someplace else. Um, and then I also wanted to say, uh, find opportunities to hone your Zoom interview skills. That seems to be really important. Yeah, I think that agency jobs, this is something that we're doing at universities now too as the first level screening. And um, boy, the practice really makes a difference. I've seen in the students that I've helped go through that. It really um, is an important point. Thank you, Diane. Um, Tom? Yeah, just a couple other ideas to include. One is if you find positions, even internship or positions or temporary positions that have a direct hiring authority um, connected with them, that means that if you've satisfied the requirements for those positions, then you're eligible for selection without competition to openings in federal service. And then the other thing, I think there was a question in there about um, should I, and maybe Adrian could address this a little bit, but um, yeah, should I have pursued getting a Knauss Fellowship? Is it absolutely necessary? I don't remember exactly how the question went in terms of getting a job. And I'd say that there are a number of different types of uh, fellowships, including presidential management, uh, fellowship programs and things like in the, in the pathways program. Um, so take a look at what's out there, but I would say it's also not necessarily a requirement to land a position um, because a number of people are, are hired into positions that haven't gone through uh, like a Knauss fellowship or a presidential management fellowship or something like that. So just to keep that in mind, um, because those other, those are large time commitments. So you may want to weigh that against um, being into a position directly. Right. Really helpful, thank you. Um, Adrian? Yeah, I just wanna to speak to the, you know, postdoc to permanent position question. Um, and I'll provide the advice that my mentor gave me, which was make yourself indispensable. <laughs> um, understand the agency's mission and how, what the, how the science that you're doing informs the agency's mission and try to strategically get yourself yourself involved in longer term projects within the agency, right? By And that is one way to make yourself indispensable, right? So you, you need, then your supervisors will have to keep you around, right? Um, and yeah, postdocs, postdoc fellowships are a great way to do that. Great. Um, Scott? Yeah, so a few things. I think Kind of following on what Tom said at EPA, we offer Pathways fellowships and they're announced every couple of years. There's no consistent basis because it's always based upon appropriations and whether or not we're at our ceiling for individuals. But that is a way, that is a, 
that is a competitive process by which somebody comes in as, as kind of like an intern or a postdoc that then transition into a federal position non-competitively. Um, <clears throat> the other way is through, we have ORISE fellows, ORAL students, um, AAAS fellows, CANAS fellows come through as well. Um, they don't guarantee a federal position on the back end. Um, they, if there's a position that becomes available in a group um, that is competed competitively. And so that's why a lot of our fellows um, surprisingly stay on at the agency, but essentially will move to a different part. They'll move to a program office like the Office of Water or the Office of Air, and then eventually make their way back around. And so you, we keep, I keep bumping into my fellows that I've had over the years and, and surprised to see them on the same floor that you're walking around on. Um, you know, I think, um, I think I'll stop there. I had one other thing to say about it, but I forgot. Cool. Thank you. Um, kind of jumping around a little bit in the question box here. Um, there were a few questions about, um, differences in working for an agency versus working in academia. And if there is anything in particular that, um, is is really different that you want to highlight. I know some of you have spoken to that. Um, do you feel that there are any constraints? Um, is there, um, you know, the I, as somebody spoke to the academic freedom that we feel in academia, um, do you feel that you're constrained in any way from that in your federal job? Um, and let's see. Yeah, Scott, you still have your hand up and, and lots of hands might, going up. So I can, I can answer this. I mean, I'll take a first crack at this one. Um, there are differences um, in academia and in the government. Um, I think one of the benefits of government is that at least within our organization, um, funding your research is not as crazy. We don't you don't have to write massive grant proposals. You don't have to compete for funds. Um, we have a four year planning process. Um, it's a collaborative um, process. Um, that said, we do applied research, and that research has to fit a programmatic need. Um, we, we don't do basic science at EPA. Um, we are not a basic science agency. We are an applied science agency. So it doesn't mean that we don't do innovative science. It doesn't mean that we don't do forward-looking science and are what we call anticipatory science. We still do that but we don't do basic science. Everything has to have kind of a reason and an application um, in protecting our, in fulfilling our mission of protection of human health and the environment. Um, <clears throat> so we're, there's still a lot of, um, we have very strong scientific integrity policies. And so there is, there, there is still that academic freedom. Um, you, we, <laughs> we're not allowed to squash science. Like if a manuscript is coming through, it's reviewed for policy re relevancy, making sure that you know, it's not okay for an ORD scientist to say that they think the water quality criteria for the Florida Everglades should be 10 parts per billion. That's a policy decision, but they can talk about the science that says, you know, we see change in a biological community less than 10, because that provides the scientific evidence that informs the policy. <clears throat> so there is a difference. Um, I don't think there, I mean, it really just comes down to who you are and what you want to do. Great. Um, I would encourage the panel, other panelists to, um, you know, maybe uh, see if you can type a few answers in there because we're getting um, close to the end of the period to the questions that we might not have gotten to yet. Um, but Jed um, and Diane and, and Laurel, and then I think we'll have to um, uh, cap off the, the question, the answering. <clears throat> um, let's see. Diane. <clears throat> Okay, I was going to say one of the big differences for me, again, with the USGS, we were addressing big problems, studying acid rock drainage, I became an academic, and suddenly you're writing NSF proposals, you, with your colleagues, you send off a proposal and don't hear anything for six months, eight months, a year, and then you find out if you're going to do that research or not, and so it's kind of adds this surprise research direction or you know disappointment that that was a great idea but it's not going to happen cuz you don't have any money so it's it's a very different pace right uh, laurel yeah i found my first job with the usgs at a grad school to be very much like academia in that i was pursuing research questions that were very much aligned with my passions and interests had a lot of flexibility in in doing so there were research seminars 
But I ended up leaving the USGS because um, I, I ended up feeling rather constrained in the types of new work that I could propose. Um, it was during a time of budget austerity, uh, and there are various restrictions that come into play as to whether or not USGS investigators can apply for external funds through, say, NSF. And I wanted the opportunity to cast my net a little more widely. So I, I would say that maybe the research funding could be a little more secure, but also more constrained within agencies. Um, and you have tend to have a little more freedom in academia, but uh, also might have to put out many more proposals before something lands. Wonderful. Well, you sort of spoke to this, Laurel, but I see um, just sort of a pair of questions that we might end with. And that's um, how does funding work within agencies and um, how does politics affect availability of support for the kinds of work that you um, need and want to do? <clears throat> Scott. So I would say one of the biggest challenges working in the federal government is that our budget is appropriated every year. Um, there is no guarantee that this year's budget will be next year's budget. So if you put in to do a four-year research project, you're getting funding on an annual basis and you follow the budget process pretty well, right? So the president puts in his budget, which is grandiose. It's what they're saying. This is what we need to run the federal government. And then it hits the hill and it goes through the appropriation process and it goes the back and forth between the House and the Senate. A lot of times they can't make a decision. So you get a continuing resolution. So you're working on partial funding um, until you actually get the appropriation to come in. And so you actually get the funds and, those, and Congress decides what those funds are. And now they decide what those funds should be spent on. And so we do have kind of line items that are fund the majority of our research, but we are now being, because earmarks are back, um, we're now being tasked with doing a lot more um, specific research and specific areas to fulfill a particular request of somebody on the Hill. Um, that provides a lot of uncertainty. It's a lot of frustration. And the politics in terms of, that's where the politics comes in in funding. So if you have a split house like we do now, it won't be as lovely as it was last year. <laughs> um, we won't see the, the increase in funding that we got. We'll likely see a reduction. Um, and then how severe that is will just be dependent upon how, how much the fight happens. And then if it swings the other way, so if it goes from a Democratic to a full Republican, then things become really tight. And then you, you, you just have to move and deal with it. But we've never not done work. Great, thank you. Um, Adrian. Yeah, I'll just add that um, in my, for, for a position like mine where I'm doing a sustained project, sustained observing, there's a portion of NOAA funding that gets allocated every year to that sustained funding. And that's the majority of my portfolio. But like I mentioned before, I work with a very collaborative international community of ocean carbon scientists. I have, I'm affiliated with the university. I have lots of colleagues that are at nonprofits and, and um, in industry all over. And so that opens up a whole nother series of potential funding that I can bring in. So, um, you know, I do the sustained observing that's supported by NOAA, and there's a part of my portfolio for innovation and research and, and new stuff too through those funding sources. Cool. Before I get to Jed, I'm going to just throw in one last question because I think it's, it's one I see a few times in here, which is opportunities for international folks who would like to um, go the federal pathway but aren't citizens yet. Um, and Jed, you might not be speaking to that one, but if we could squeeze that in after your comment, that'll be great. Sure. I just wanted to say about, you know, just take a, a unique take on the pol politics. I work for um, Seminole Tribe of Florida. Um, so I'm federal in the sense that Seminole Tribe is a, is, is a sovereign nation and we really have kind of a federal program. We have a series of municipalities that are administered as well. Um, so I work kind of at a federal level and, and a municipality level. The bottom line with politics, though, is as a scientist, it's important that I don't royal political process. Like I can't be the I can't be the cause of the tension. Um, we're always pushing up against politics because politics is basically the decision making process for how resources are distributed. So as an ecologist, I'm very interested in how resources are distributed. 
um, it's not a surprise that we'll always be up against and in, in intersecting with the political process. What we try to do when we're skillful is to shape it by nudging and identifying the prevailing forces that are likely to act on political um, decisions. So helping, helping decision makers understand the consequences of their decisions, even when they're gonna be unanticipated or unexpected. Um, but with respect to, you know, I try not to make headlines and I try to keep the decision makers that are present with me out of the headlines, um, unless they decide that they wanna make headlines. And then I just support them. Over. Thank you. Um, and any last thought for um, folks who might be online who are um, international students? Is there any opportunity within um, your agencies for international students? Uh, Laura. So, yeah. So, so the majority of our positions are for U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. There are mechanisms where the, the service will use a contractor to do work that's related to what the service needs, but it wouldn't be as a federal Fish and right. Wildlife Service employee. It would be as a contractor mm -hmm. to the service kind of thing. Thank you for that reminder that there are those contractual sort of um, appointments out there as well. And um, Grizel, we'll take one last comment and then we'll have to wrap up. Sure. I would like to offer that there is an international programs um, mm -hmm. in the Washington office for the Forest Service where internships are available uh, for people uh, working on uh, having other visas from the U.S. Yeah. Oh, terrific news. Thank you so much. That's great to hear. Um, well, we are a little bit after the top of the hour um, and the end of the day, and I just want to end by really thanking our wonderful panelists so, so much for your time out of your extremely busy schedules um, to be here today and to guide our students into uh, what it's like in your position and how to navigate as you move forward, as they move forward into uh, their careers that might involve um, federal appointments. So uh, thank you, thank you so, so much. And um, also thanks to the network office, to Marty and Gabe, um, as well as Paige for all the organization that you've done and, and Tom uh, Fish as well at the uh, CESU um, network office uh, for supporting uh, this event today. So thanks to all the attendees. We're so glad you're able to be here today and for all of your great questions. Um, we will try to get back out to all of you that registered with the recording um, so that uh, we can share that with folks who might not have been able to attend the whole thing. Um, thank you so much and have a great evening. Bye-bye. <clears throat>